Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokulski.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, Muscle Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski, and as always, we're going out and finding the world's foremost experts, and today is no exception. This gentleman is changing the paradigm of the way people eat, and he's been leading the way for a long time, um, literally uh, creating new paradigms around what you should be eating for health, and maybe even redefining the term health. Um, Dr. Stephen Gundry, the author of The Plant Paradox, and if you guys aren't familiar with the book, go out and get it now because it will change your thoughts about how to eat. Um, I've, Dr. Gundry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, I've welcomed uh, many, many amazing guests, and nobody has ever challenged the paradigm around eating quote-unquote whole foods, and everybody says, ah, you got to eat whole foods and you're going to be healthy, and, and I'm guilty just as anybody else. And I love the fact that you're going even deeper than that because so many people just look at, oh, well, it comes from the earth. It must be healthy. Uh, and I love that you're challenging that. So can you tell us about, first of all, how this came to be? And, and just so you know, my audience is um, men, typically men. We've got some women, but typically men who are very interested in health. And, and muscle building is, is a focus, but muscle building, um, they realize, is uh, a process rather than a necessary goal. And uh, these guys really just want to live their most optimal life and have optimal brain function and look and feel awesome. So how did you, how did you discover the idea of lectins? And um, tell us about them. Well, you know, uh, Carl Sagan used to say that uh, unless you challenge conventional wisdom, uh, there will never be progress. And um, he's, he's absolutely right. In fact, uh, I, I start one of my lectures with a quote from Natalie Merchant. Uh, many people uh, remember her, uh, a great uh, artist. She wrote a song uh, called Wonder uh, about a very uh, unusual child. But the line that I use is people see me as a challenge to their balance. If that's all I ever do is challenge your balance, then I'll, I've done a good thing. Yes. So um, I, uh, I got interested actually in lectins uh, many years ago as a undergraduate at Yale University, where I had this uh, crazy thesis back in the dark ages that you could uh, take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and arrive at a human being. And uh, I actually successfully defended my thesis and got an honors. And then I gave it to my parents and went to medical school. And so uh, my challenge to my balance occurred back in 1999 when I was a professor and chairman of heart surgery at Loma Linda University and a very famous heart surgeon. And I, I, I met a guy who I call Big Ed, who... Uh, had inoperable coronary artery disease. All of his blood vessels were clogged up. You couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't do bypass surgery. And I'm one of these surgeons who would take anybody on. And there's a few of us around the country. And Big Ed is from Miami, actually. Uh, he was 48 years old. And when I met him, he weighed 265 pounds, which, and it was not muscle. Uh, he... Uh, had gone around looking for somebody to take him on, and had spent about six months going to various centers. But he'd gone on a diet, and he had actually lost about 45 pounds in six months. And he'd gone to a health food store and bought a huge amount of supplements. And when I met him, he had this big shopping bag full of supplements. And so I looked at his angiogram from Miami of six months earlier, and I said, you know, I'm not going to help you. Everybody's right. There's nothing we can do. Everything's clogged up. And he said, well, look, you know, I've been on this diet. I'm taking these supplements. Maybe I did something in my heart. And, you know, I'm scratching my professor beard and saying, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to do anything. And I know what you did with all those supplements. 
you made expensive urine, which I firmly believed back then. Yep. And uh, he said, well, come on, let's get another angiogram. And I said, okay. So we got an angiogram. And in six months' time, this guy had cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his coronary arteries. Wow. Never seen anything like it. Now, I was pretty stupid back then. I actually operated on him and did a five-vessel bypass. But if I'd known what I know now, I would have said, hey, great job. Let's keep going. But after we're done, I said, you know, tell me about this diet. And he starts describing what he was doing. And I said, whoa, you know, time out. This is exactly my thesis from Yale University back in the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. And why it was so poignant was that I was uh, 70 pounds overweight at that time. I was running 30 miles a week. I was doing 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons on the weekend. I was going to the gym one hour every day and eating a healthy, low-fat vegetarian diet at Loma Linda, which is an Adventist vegetarian institution. And here I was with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome, I had migraine headaches when I operated on babies, and I had such bad arthritis that I actually wore uh, braces on my knees to run. Right. And I'm going, you know, I'm doing everything right, and why is all this happening to me? And, you know, people I would consult with says, well, this is your genetics, you know, your, your dad's the same way, and, and you know, too bad. So uh, after, and then with that, I said, let me look at those supplements. And I'm, I'm very famous for keeping the heart alive during heart surgery. And we use supplements down in the lab to keep hearts alive for 48 hours sitting in a bucket of ice water. And I started looking through his supplements. I said, wait a minute. You know, I use that and I use that and I use that. But I give them down the veins and arteries of a heart to protect the heart cell. And it never occurred to me to swallow the dumb thing. So... I uh, I put I called my folks and said send up my you know thesis and I put myself on my thesis and I lost 50 pounds over a year and I've lost 20 pounds subsequently and kept it off for 16 years and then I started taking a bunch of supplements and I started sending my blood work up to Berkeley University of California Berkeley and within months, uh, all of my issues went away. My migraines disappeared, my high blood pressure disappeared, my high cholesterol, and blah, blah, blah. Stopped wearing braces on my knees because my arthritis went away. So I started teaching people uh, in my practice at Loma Linda how to do this. And lo and behold, their diabetes would go away and their heart, hypertension would go away. So... In a, in a crazy day, my, my wife called it Black Friday, I, I looked in the mirror. I said, you know, I can't operate on people anymore. I know how to get rid of their problems by teaching them how to eat. And so I resigned my position and set up an institute in Palm Springs where I just asked people, you know, if you want to play with me, then every three months I want to get a bunch of blood from you, look at how your inflammation is going in your body. And, you know, we'll get insurance and Medicare will pay for this. And then I, I want to see what happens as I take certain foods away from you, have you take certain supplements. And I didn't sell supplements. I'm an academic. And so I wanted to find out what was going to happen in the experiment without me making money. I know that was dumb, but th that's what I did. So... Uh, that resulted in my first book, uh, which is called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, uh, which was published in 2008. And then a lot of people with autoimmune diseases started showing up on my door. And they'd say, what do you know about autoimmune disease? And I said, absolutely nothing. But I'm a uh, transplant immunologist. I know how to fool the immune system. So if you want to play, let's play. And we developed some very interesting tests to tell when the immune system is turned on by substances such as lectins. So can we talk and about, before you go on from there, exactly what you were finding and what you were looking for specifically when these people would come into your, into your lab and say, hey, we're going to keep, do your blood every three months. Um, what types of things were you looking for and what were you finding? 
Yeah. So uh, there were several labs that had developed some very sophisticated tests for what are called inflammatory cytokines. Sure. And uh, they were able to do it on a we used to do it in the lab, uh, but they were able to develop commercial tests that you could actually get somebody to pay for. So basically, inflammatory cytokines are how the immune system communicates mm -hmm. that there's basically an attack by a foreign invader. And our foreign invaders that our immune system looks for in general are bacteria and viruses. Uh, Obviously, before the days of antibiotics, um, if you got a bacterial infection, you know, you were screwed unless your immune system was ready to go. But one of the things that early on we found was that there were certain plant compounds called lectins that are able to actually make the immune system um, become activated. And the more I started to look into the plant defense system, the more impressed I was that plants, believe it or not, do not stand around waiting to be eaten. They actually have a life. They had it really good before animals arrived. Right. Uh, and when animals arrived, they had a real problem because they couldn't move. Uh, they couldn't run. They couldn't hide. They couldn't fight. But plants have a huge advantage. They are chemists of incredible ability. Uh, they can turn sunlight into matter, and we haven't figured out how to do that. So what they do is they use chemical compounds such as lectins. And lectins are proteins. They are sometimes called sticky proteins because they like to stick to certain sugar molecules. And their targets are sugar molecules on the lining of our gut. There are sugar molecules in the lining between nerve endings. There are sugar molecules in the lining of our joints, just to use an example. And the idea behind a plant defense system is that if you can make an animal sick, in pain, uh, depressed or anxious, or not be able to move in the case of insects, then a smart animal uh, will say, you know, every time I eat these plants or these plant babies, uh, I'm not doing pretty good and I'm not reproducing well, I'm, I'm going to go eat something else. And the plant wins, the animal wins, and, and everybody's happy. The problem for us as humans is, as most of us know, we're pretty stupid. And uh, when we eat things that uh, give us pain or don't really promote uh, our wellness, then we keep eating them. And we take a bunch of Aleve or Advil, or we take a, ne a Nexium or a Prilosec OTC, uh, or we take an antidepressant, and we assume that this is natural. And in fact, it's natural that we're having these problems because we weren't designed to eat these particular plants. Well, in reality, people just don't pay attention to what they eat, right? They assume it's in the grocery store. It must be good for me. So it's just mindlessness that, that is ultimately the problem. And if people started paying attention to how they feel when they eat foods, there'd be a substantial increase in the number of people who didn't eat lectins. Yeah. You know, let me let me give you a great example, uh, which is, is kind of a fun example. Um, uh, if, you, if you follow the blogosphere, um, number one, the book is very popular. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, number two, there are some aggressive vegan authors yep. who somehow think that I'm anti-plant, and nothing can be further from the truth. I am at, a, at first at first uh, sight. That's what it sounds like. It's a, you know the plant paradox, right? But in, you know people are ignorant and don't want to read the book. Yeah, okay. uh, and a, a lot of the uh, authors who subscribe to the blue blue zone mm -hmm. theory that there are certainly areas in the world where there are long-lived people. And these authors ascribe their long-livedness to the fact that they eat grains and beans, whole grains and beans, and that this is the healthy way to a long life. Well, uh, having lived in a blue zone for half of my life, Loma Linda University, 
uh, I can tell you that uh, that whole concept is absolutely wrong. False. And let me give you the best example is the Okinawans. Uh, the Okinawans, very long lived people in Japan. And the Okinawans, 80% of the calories that the old Okinawans ate was a purple sweet potato, 80%. And a purple sweet potato, if it's cooked, has no lectins. It's a tuber. It's actually what we evolved to eat. Mm -hmm. The uh, bean that they eat is primarily miso and a little bit of tofu, but it only con constitutes 6% of their diet. The other 6% that is, you know, measurable is white rice, not brown rice. And it's, it's hilarious. The authors of the Okinawan diet said, you know, imagine how much healthier the Okinawans would be if they ate brown rice instead of white rice. Boy, are they stupid. Right. Let's fix them. And, and, and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're studying some of the oldest living people in the world. And trying to make them and trying to fix them. Yeah. It's right. like. How come they're eating white rice? How come they're not eating brown rice? And in fact, if you look at Asians in general, the 4 billion people use rice as their staple. Right. And yet 4 billion people eat white rice, not brown rice. Maybe they're trying to tell us something that the hall of the grain has some problems in it. And in fact, that's where the hall is concentrated. So I think a lot of my listeners would be angry with me if I didn't get you to dive deep into the mechanism of um, of lectins and talking about these quote unquote sticky proteins. Is it, is it a similar like lipopolysaccharide situation, like similar to gluten, or or can you walk through the, um, the actual yeah. scientific mechanism? Yeah. So gluten happens to be a lectin. Uh, it's actually a fairly minor lectin in the scheme of things. So what lectins do? We'll talk about the gut first. Um, lectins. Uh, bind to a receptor on the enterocyte. And I hope your listeners know that mm -hmm. the gut is about the same surface area as a tennis court. And the lining of the gut is only one cell thick. And these enterocytes are all held together with what are called tight junctions. And to visualize this, most people have played the, the kids game Red Rover, Red Rover where we all locked arms. Uh, and the idea was the big kid was supposed to uh, run across and break through the line. So our cells are held together with these tight junctions. Mm -hmm. So lectins bind to the enterocyte, and they flip a switch. And the switch makes a compound called zonulin. And zonulin breaks the tight junction. So now there's a gap. Now... Lectins get through that gap, but also you brought up lipopolysaccharides, mm -hmm. LPSs. So LPSs are the cell wall of bacteria. And we view the cell wall of bacteria as if it was a live bacteria. Our immune system can't tell the difference. It's reading the barcode on the cell wall. So when our gut is permeated by both lectins, and LPSs, our immune system is basically the border patrol on the other side of our border. And about 65% of all of our white blood cells are bunched along the border of our gut for an obvious reason, because that's where folks get through. Mm -hmm. So lectins are viewed as a uh, what's called a protein uh, mimicker that actually mimics other proteins in our body. It has looks a lot like, for instance, the myelin sheath. It looks a lot like the uh, synovial membrane. It looks a lot like certain skin proteins. So our immune system gets activated, and we can measure that activation with inflammatory cytokines. And our immune system basically goes to threat level five. We're under attack. The invaders have crossed the border. And we should scramble the fighter jets, and we should go around the body, and wherever we see uh, lipopolysaccharides or wherever we see lectins, we should shoot to kill and ask questions later. And 
it's called molecular mimicry. Uh, Lauren Cordain was one of the first to describe it, and I've uh, described it uh, as well and actually quantified it in my work. And I've actually presented papers where people with autoimmune disease, if we take lectins away from them, their autoimmune disease subsides, goes away and we can watch their markers of autoimmune disease return to normal. And like I talk about in the book, if we re-challenge people with certain lectins, we can actually then watch the immune system reactivate. We can watch the inflammatory cytokines reactivate. And so it's not, this is not anecdotal. It's not telling stories. It's actually based on blood work every three months in thousands of patients. Brilliant. And, you know, so for the last, um, you know, seven to eight years, I've been teaching people about the benefits of eating a low inflammation diet. And I didn't attach to any particular types of foods, but particularly advocating a low inflammation <laughs> diet. Can we talk about that? And obviously that's a similar conversation. And what, what are the negative effects that people don't think about that inflammation is causing in their body? Yeah. So, uh, inflammation is the root cause of, of everything that happens to anybody. Um, Dale Bredesen, probably the smartest guy in the world on dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, and I uh, both agree that dementia is basically <clears throat> the brain protecting itself against perceived inflammation. And, uh, one of my patients that I talk about in The Plant Paradox is really illustrative of uh, inflammation. Um, so there, there's a guy who I call Tony in the book who had uh, vitiligo. And m most of your readers or listeners probably know vitiligo is where you lose pigmentation. Mm -hmm. And Michael Jackson had vitiligo. Um, and it no one knows, quote, the real cause, but it's thought to be an autoimmune uh, disease. Mm -hmm where our body attacks uh, the pigment-forming cells called melanocytes. And melanocytes are actually modified nerves. So uh, Tony was one of my early adapters, and he came back to see me. Uh, this was well over 10 years ago. And he said, hey, I want, I want you to see this, my vitiligo. He had vitiligo all over his hands and on his face. He said, my vitiligo is gone. He says, what do you know about that? And I'm going, wow, you know, that's really interesting. I know my diet is anti-inflammatory, but that's naive to say that inflammation was the cause of your vitiligo. What I wanted to know was, you know, why was his body attacking his melanocytes? And so I said, now let's see, uh, melanocytes are nerve cells. Uh, plants made lectins originally to get rid of their original predator, okay. which was an insect. And it turns out that lectins are really good at mimicking some of the proteins on nerves and the myelin sheath. And the idea of a lectin to a plant and an insect was to paralyze the insect. So I said, so I started looking at all the things that I had asked people to, like Tony to take away. And I said, you know, the commonality here is not that I'm having you eat anti-inflammatory foods, but it's the foods I'm taking away from you. And so we started, interestingly enough, uh, I lost contact with him for several years. And the next time I saw him, his vitiligo was back. And I said, whoa, you know, you know, what's the deal? And he says, well, you know, it's really hard to eat the way you want me to eat. Nah, vitiligo's not so bad. And I said, this is a great opportunity. I said, how about, you know, doing this again? You know, let's, let's test the thesis. And he said, yeah, okay, wh what the heck? Well, we, uh, there was a big meeting up at Harvard back in April um, on brain health, and he happened to be chairing the session. And I ran into him and his vitiligo was gone. And I said, you know, would you, you know, get up during the session and tell your story? And he, and he did. And he said, I'm telling you, folks, you know, I had vitiligo here. I had vitiligo here. 
look, it's gone. And it's all because I took lectins back out of my diet. And it was the lectins that was making my immune system, by mistake, attack these modified nerve cells in my skin that are called melanocytes. And when I took lectins out of my diet, my immune system relaxed, wasn't looking for particular proteins, and my melanocytes came back. Other than other than something like vitiligo, what would be this, the some of the other physical manifestations of uh, inflammation or of lectin exposure? Yeah. So obviously, my demographic is concerned with uh, aesthetics, brain function, and living a long life. And obviously, digestion we both know is massive. But just giving them something to kind of latch on to, so they can get excited about eating this way, that they can relate into their diet. Well, let's talk about brain health. Uh, I, I I see tons of people with brain fog and one of the one of the things that i've been very impressed with what lectins are capable of doing is they nerves talk to each other by acetylcholine jumping from one nerve to another and in that little space there's actually a sugar molecule called sialic acid and it just so happens that sialic acid is one of the favorite targets of lectins. And when lectins bind onto sialic acid, you actually can't have nerves uh, talk to each other. So that's number one. But number two is, is a whole lot deeper dive than that. And this is something that uh, Dale Bredesen, who is the head of the Buck Institute, he's a professor at UCLA, and he's the author of The End of Alzheimer's. Uh, both of us think that dementia and Alzheimer's is actually because there are supporting cells of neurons uh, that uh, are basically the bodyguards of neurons. And these are called glial cells or microglia. And these bodyguards actually nourish the neurons. They take care of them. And they're part of the immune system, which was a fairly recent discovery. Now, if these glial cells sense a threat, a threat from either LPSs or lectins, they actually, like bodyguards, they surround the neuron, which is a, a superstar, if you will. Uh, and they try to protect the neuron from these invaders. They do such a good job that the neuron essentially starves to death. And we're beginning to realize more and more that it's this interaction between the glial cells and the neuron that are the cause of neuron death. They actually protect the neuron too well, if you will. And it's, it's kind of like the neurons, the castle, and there's an invading horde, and you pull up the drawbridges to keep the horde out of the castle. But unless you get food into the castle, the inhabitants starve to death. And so this theory that dementia is actually because of trying to protect neurons from a perceived threat, inflammation, that's uh, really turning our heads around how dementia comes about. So if people want great brain health, you've got to get to the source of your great brain health, and the, the source is actually your gut. Hey, I interrupt this podcast to bring you something really exciting from the muscle intelligence community. That's right, me. I want to send you guys all over to my YouTube channel uh, to check out all the new content coming out around exercise execution. Many of you don't realize how vital exercise execution is to your success, whether you be attempting to lose fat or especially build muscle. Uh, make the most of your time. We are the best in the world at teaching you how to optimize every minute you're in the gym. Nobody wants to waste time. Nobody wants to leave the gym wondering they've got the job done. Get in there, get it done in the shortest amount of time. Know without a shadow of a doubt that you've achieved the goal you set out to achieve, whether that be muscle building, fat loss, or strength gain. We're going to teach you how to do all that stuff in the simplest way possible using the muscle intelligence principles. Check out Muscle Intelligence on YouTube and enjoy the rest of the podcast. 
So would you say that lectins are actually more harmful than gluten? Because obviously everyone in the world right now is attaching to this gluten-free diet. Uh, lectins in general, two questions, and you can kind of answer them um, side by side. Are, are all lectins the same? And conversely, are, are, you know, is uh, gluten a little less um, worrisome than lectins? So gluten, interestingly enough, if you look at people who have extreme gluten intolerance, celiac disease, the standard way of... Uh, Determining celiac disease is a biopsy. We actually do it with uh, immune markers, but biopsy is still the gold standard. You can take people with biopsy-proven celiac disease, put them on a gluten-free diet. 73% of them, after two years, will still have celiac disease by biopsy. Hmm. That's because most gluten-free foods that people are told to eat have lectins, hmm. which are actually worse than gluten. And one of the things that's been fascinating to me is we take those people with known celiac disease who've been on a gluten-free diet, and they're clearly better. There's no doubt about it. But then we take the other major lectins away from them, and all of their immune markers and all of their celiac markers then go away. And it wasn't until we took these other gluten-free foods away from them that it goes away. Now, yeah, there are... There are lectins in all plants, and the you know the old uh, the old quote that the dose makes the poison uh, is very very true, and there's clearly some genetic propensity to uh, lectin tolerance. Uh, if you have an interesting family history, uh, for instance, if you've had your tonsils removed or if you've had your appendix out. I can guarantee you, you are intolerant to major lectins. Hmm. Uh, if you have a family history of autoimmune diseases, if there's hypothyroidism in the family, if there's a family history of irritable bowel, interestingly, there's, if there's a family history of anxiety or depression, it's probably lectins. Now, that sounds really crazy, but... You can actually do animal studies where you take lectins and inject them into the bellies of rats, and the rat will actually develop such depression and anxiety that they will cower in a corner. They will not go out and explore their space, and you can repeat this over and over again. And it's if you think about it from a plant's standpoint, if your predator is cowering in a corner and not going out looking for food, that's a really good defense strategy. You win. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, and, you know, we just don't give plants their due. Uh, one of my real eye-openers, and I really recommend it, Michael, most people may have heard of Michael Pollan. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Pollan's first book was called The Botany of Desire. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read it, read it. And it's actually all about how plants manipulate us. And, uh, you know, the longer I've been studying plants since Yale University, the more impressed I am with, uh, with them. They've had four million years to figure all this out. Uh, so. Another book that comes to mind speaking to that is, is The Hidden Life of Trees. And, and in the book, he brings up, I'm sure you know the book, he brings up the idea of... The, of you know, plants being able to produce little neurotoxins. Is that kind of the level we're talking with lectins here, like, or with lectins? They're literally at that level of um, neurotoxin? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, plants, their pharmacopoeia is just so extensive to try and make, you know, either animals do their bidding or make animals go away. It's just... I don't know. I'm, I'm very impressed with them, as you can tell. And it, as you know from the hidden life of trees, a trees will support a sick neighbor. They will actually send food and root supply system to a sick tree. And, I mean, to think that that sort of community spirit exists in a forest is, is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we think we're a pretty unique creature. Uh, but in, in fact, you know, we can d dive deep into who actually controls us, but I got news for you. Our bacteria and mold and funguses control us, yeah. uh, not, not us. 
Um, ironic you're saying that. I'm actually headed out to the World Microbiome Conference in Berlin next week and uh, super excited to learn about that. You know, the discoveries and the advancements in the microbiome are, are fascinating. And I, and I read that you had really dived deep on understanding the microbiome for a really long time. Um, anything you, any advice you want to give people? Because I, I know all my listeners are sitting at home right now saying, well, what the hell can I eat? I can't, I, I can't eat vegetables. Meat, some people think are bad for me. Can't eat dairy. What are the things that can help heal a digestive tract, can optimize a microbiome, and can allow people to actually live a uh, enjoy food? Because ultimately, it's it seems so restricted, right? Is it is it better to eat a very small amount of foods in large amounts, or can you still have the diversity that we need to actually flourish? Oh yeah, uh, you know, you eat what you were designed to eat. Um, we, you know, studying hunter gatherers uh, like the the Bushmen, like the Hansa, these people eat uh, about 250 different plant species on a rotating basis, mm-hmm. and all of those plants have incredible uh, polyphenols, phytochemicals that actually promote uh, our bacterial population and promote good health, but. We're designed to eat certain things. We're designed to eat leaves. We are, we're actually tree-dwelling apes. And we're designed to eat tubers. Uh, we've been eating tubers for about 150,000 years since fire was harnessed. And we've clearly been eating fish and shellfish. And we've clearly been eating wild animals for a considerable period of time. But what we haven't been designed to eat, we... No great ape has ever been observed eating grasses. You can't eat beans because uncooked beans are so toxic that we use them as some of our best poisons. Ricin is the lectin of the castor bean, and a couple molecules of ricin will kill you. Hmm. You, Now, you can pressure cook uh, vegetables. You can pressure cook beans and destroy lectins. In fact, pressure cooking is the only known way to destroy lectins. Lectins are heat intolerant. I mean, tolerant. They just heat won't kill lectins. Acid is really good for destroying lectins. And there's a paper out today that shows that people who take acid reducing drugs like Nexium or Prilosec actually have huge increases of liver disease, um, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, because their bacterial population has changed because the bacteria haven't been killed by acid, and the lectins have not been killed by acid. And I talk about this in the book, that if you want to have good health, make sure a Nexium or Prilosec never crosses your mouth. The... So the other thing that we have never eaten up until 500 years is American plants. Uh, None of us are from America. You know, sorry, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're we're from Europe. We're from Asia. We're from Africa. And none of us were exposed to American lectin foods until 500 years ago. And some of our most beloved foods are high lectin-containing foods. The nightshades like potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, goji berries are all American. Peanuts and cashews. These are actually American beans. Cashews are actually the poison ivy family. And I I can't tell you the number of people with either an autoimmune disease or a digestive issue that cashews or peanuts are one of the big mischief makers. So... Uh, milk, it turns out that the, there's a protein in milk that most people react to, and it's called casein A1. And most of our American milk is the wrong breed of cow. Uh, goats and sheep have casein A2. Uh, most cows in France, Italy, and Switzerland are casein A2. Uh, buffalo, mozzarella, water buffalo are casein A2. So milk per se is not the big problem. It's actually casein A1. And it's all in the book. Is there something, some sort of a cross um, contamination, wrong word, but you'll get what I'm saying. As, as if people are developing this permeability in their gut from lectins and gluten, is there, are they going to see some type of cross 
inflammation from things like dairy and other other foods? Because I know a lot of people are seeing some this allergies are so prominent. I'm just curious what your belief is around that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I used to have such bad allergies that I used to get uh, allergy shots as a kid and actually through college. And um, there's in my practice, I see people that are so allergic to everything that some of them can't even go outside. Um, and I detail that in the book. And what happens with allergies is if, once your gut is leaky, uh, your immune system goes absolutely haywire, and it doesn't want to make a mistake. So if it sees a foreign protein, it'll shoot to kill, even if in the past that protein didn't cause anything. Um, for instance, 94% of us actually have a antibody to the peanut lectin. But most people up until a few years ago uh, never reacted to peanuts. And that's because... Up until 50 years ago, most of us had an intact microbiome in our gut. Uh, most of us had an intact gut wall. And so our immune system, our microbiome, if it's in good shape, actually teaches our immune system that the immune system, relax, you know, we're a bunch of good kids down here. We've got things under control. Go have a donut and just chill out. But now... Uh, the bugs in our gut are totally deranged. Uh, the wall of our gut is being penetrated. Just to your listeners, when you have an ache and pain, please don't take an Aleve or Advil. These are like swallowing hand grenades. They actually blow gaping holes in the wall of your gut. And this is actually from the pharmaceutical literature. Um, so all this stuff has changed. So it's amazing. I, I see people's allergies just go away when you finally heal their gut. So what's the difference now compared to a few years ago when people had intact, intact um, gut walls? So is it the pharmaceuticals? You know, I'll let you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's multifactorial. We've, we've killed off our microbiome. We're given antibiotics for any little sniffle, any little cold, any little cough. And most of these are viruses that aren't affected by antibiotics. And we didn't know that a broad spectrum antibiotic kills all of our bugs. In fact, there's good literature that shows that after a single course of antibiotics, your gut flora, is, it, it's like a tropical rainforest and you threw napalm on it and it burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. And you can take a bunch of probiotics, and that's like planting new little seedlings. But if you really think you're going to get a tropical rainforest back in a few weeks, you know, I, I've got oceanfront property in Palm Springs to sell you. Right. Uh, it just doesn't happen. In fact, there's one study that shows after two years of following individuals after antibiotics, they had a single bacterial species in their in their colons wow. where there, where there should be 10,000 or more different species all interacting. So antibiotics are in all of our food. Uh, and even if it says antibiotic free, don't believe it. Uh, the FDA allows a veterinarian on a chicken farm if one chicken looks ill He's not going to dose that one chicken. He's going to dose the entire flock. And it's perfectly legal to do that and not disclose that it happens. In fact, you probably saw in the news a few months ago that a natural poultry producer in the South, 67% of the poultry actually still had antibiotic remnants in them. Mm -hmm. So we're eating those antibiotics in the food we eat. And lastly, uh, most of our grains have been treated with Roundup. Glyphosate. That was, that was my next question. You read my mind. Yeah. And we used to, this was originally designed to uh, protect GMO crops. But what's happened to us is that uh, industrial agriculture needs to harvest a field on a certain date to have their uh, harvesters on a field on a date. And that field should be ready for harvest, and that means it should be dead and dry. So we now routinely spray conventional crops, uh, corn, wheat, soybeans, with Roundup. Oh, and also um, 
canola with Roundup to desiccate it, to dry it out so that it can be harvested. Now, do you really think we wash the Roundup off, off the corn, the wheat, the soybeans, the canola? No, of course not. So these are then not only fed to animals, but they go into our conventional food supply, into our corn chips, into our cereals, into our breads. And we then eat it. Now, the Monsanto company had promised that Roundup is harmless to us, but because we don't use what's called the shikimate pathway that kills plants. But it turns out the bacteria use the shikimate pathway. And so Roundup decimates our bacteria population. But in addition to that, Roundup screws up with gluten. It actually makes gluten far more sensitive to people who aren't gluten sensitive. Mm -hmm. It changes the molecule. Lastly, Roundup screws up with our vitamin D metabolism in our liver. And one of the things that's been fascinating to me is that most people that I see with any sort of problem have a very low vitamin D level. And quite frankly, vitamin D levels should be 70 to 100. And please, if your doctor tells you your vitamin D level of 40 is too high and to back off your vitamin D, don't do that. Vitamin D is essential to help us repair our gut. It actually stimulates stem cells in the crypts of our intestines to grow. And without vitamin D, those stem cells don't grow and you don't repair their gut, your gut. Um, and Roundup is now present in almost everything. In fact, Roundup is in American wines, if you can believe it. And it's even in several organic American wines. Hmm. And you probably just heard that, you know, Bayer bought Monsanto. And Bayer, obviously, is from the EU. And there is now a motion in front of the EU to legalize Roundup. And I just hope this fails. Uh, no. Yeah, completely agree with you. So what do we eat? What do you eat? Um, <laughs> so I, yeah. yeah, so I, I, eat a, I eat a lot of, I eat a lot of leaves. Uh, I drink a lot of olive oil. Uh, people hear me joke that the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. <laughs> and I firmly believe that. Uh, you should try to get about a liter of olive oil a week into you. And you do that by eating food. Uh, I'll tell you what I, my wife and I had last night. Um, we had a, a large mixed green solid with several avocados in it with olive oil and uh, Bragg's uh, apple cider vinegar dressing. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, had a pasture soup with millet. And I poured uh, about a half cup of olive oil on my millet soup. Now, why millet? And it turns out there's two grains that aren't technically grains. They're hull-less, and millet and sorghum. And they don't have lectins, which is fascinating to me. And you can actually look at several great cultures with, that have good health, uh, particularly in Africa. And millet and sorghum are their grains of choice. Hmm. Uh, so don't be afraid of millet and sorghum. Uh, I make sorghum popcorn. You can actually find sorghum popcorn. Mm -hmm. It tastes exactly like popcorn, but it's very tiny. Uh, and it, it, we have recipes in the book. That's exactly what I was going to say. Thank goodness you, you've provided um, pages and pages and pages of, of great low lectin and lectin free recipes in your book, uh, The Plant Paradox, which again, everyone should head out and get. Uh, I've also tried mm, five or six of your products, uh, perilla seed oil, citrus, polyphenols, lectin shield, uh, and olive leaf extract, all of which I think have massive uh, value, and you've gone to great lengths, obviously, to design those really, really well for, for this scenario. So I'm uh, just giving you a little shout-out for, for those awesome products. Um, yeah, you know, yep. uh, I, I designed lectin shield. You can... Lectins, we know how lectins work, and we know what their targets are. And you can actually have sugar molecules to attract lectins. Mm -hmm. And so you can't avoid lectins, um, but you can certainly minimize their effect. And so I designed Lectin Shield uh, to 
minimize the effect of lectins. It's not a license to cheat, right. uh, as some of my patients think. But if I'm going out to a friend's house or if I'm going out to dinner, I just pop a couple lectin shield before I go. And uh, I've, I've tested this on myself many times and, and on our focus groups and on our patients, and they really do work. Is there, and, is, there, is there a reason why you chose perilla seed oil as an omega-3 source? Yeah. So perilla, most people don't know about perilla. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a popular oil. Uh, it's actually the favorite oil of Korea and much of China. And I got fascinated with perilla because it actually has the highest concentration of alpha linoleic acid, which is an omega-3 fat of any of the oils. But it has one really distinguishing feature, and it has rosmarinic acid. And so rosmarinic acid comes from rosemary. And I began studying this uh, culture in southern Italy, uh, which is a small fishing village called Acciaroli. And I've posted several YouTube videos about my visit there. This is... Per capita, they have the most people over the age of 100 of any population mm. in the world. About a third of the people of this village are over 100. Wow. And their diet is fascinating. Their diet is anchovies. They eat anchovies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm. But every meal is cooked with rosemary, and they sit around and chew rosemary all day long. And they use huge amounts of olive oil, and they drink a lot of wine. And uh, one of the things that caught researchers' attention early on is the the men, these old 100-year-old guys, apparently are incredibly horny. And uh, <laughs> it, it, Sounds it, like a party. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, you know, so your listeners, uh, you know. So rosemarinic acid, uh, both Dale Bredesen and I will tell you, is one of the compounds that keeps nerves alive and well. Hmm. And I think it's no surprise that the mentation of people who use perilla oil has been well documented and the mentation of these people in Acciaroli, Italy. So I not only use perilla oil for its rosemarinic acid, but just to give a shameless plug, my omega-3 uh, capsule has rosemary extract in it along with the highest DHA per capsule that you can find. Uh, right now it's sold out, but follow Gundry MD. It'll be back soon. It, it, it was too popular. Sorry about that. No, thank you. We appreciate you doing such great work and researching all these products. And I'm sure my demographics are going to love this. So, Dr. Gundry, thank you so much for your time. Um, I will definitely link to your website in the show notes. Um, so anyone who wants to check that out, it's benpokolsky.com slash podcasts, and we'll be getting this podcast up really soon. Get Dr. Gundry, we'll let you know. Great. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much, sir. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Take care. This podcast is brought to you by ATP Labs. ATP brings you a wide array of health-oriented products, everything from performance-based pre-workouts, uh, sleep optimization, and everything that you need to optimize internal health. And the reason I love ATP is they actually care about what goes into their products as much as you care what goes into your body. And that's why I've chosen to align with ATP. Um, integrity, you guys know I'm all about integrity and having a purpose in everything you do. Um, ATP invests tons of money in research and development and making sure they have the best sourced products on the planet. You guys are going to love their products. The product I'm kind of hooked on right now is the Optizome. I take three before bed every night, and I sleep through the entire night. Imagine that, the impossible dream. Through the night, every night, minimum seven hours, which you guys know for me is massive. Um, and it's all quantified using my Aura Ring, and I use the Aura Ring again every night to uh, make sure that I know that I'm getting the right sleep. And I can actually test and see hey, if I expose myself to some blue light before bed, does it influence my REM sleep? And the answer is yes. So doing some things before sleep to making sure that I wake up in the morning with an S on my chest is massive. So I suggest each of you guys head out, pick up some Optizome. Uh, and if you're really interested in being geeking out about it and quantifying it, Aura has also been so generous as to offer us a discount, which you can find at the show notes at benpokolsky.com slash podcasts. Peace and love. 
Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Head on over to iTunes right now and leave me a review. Let me know if you loved it. Let me know if you absolutely hated it. Either way, I need to know so I can improve my job uh, and bring you guys the best information with respect to muscle building, health optimization, and building a better person, building a better man. Um, So thank you very much to our sponsors, which make this stuff possible. Um, I'd love for you guys to each head over and check out atplab.com, ATP Labs or ATP Lab. Either one works. Um, ATP is a company I've recently aligned with because they have world-class manufacturing and everything they do is third-party tested and proven to be what it is inside the bottle that it says it is on the label. And you guys know that's massive. And not only that, we're getting the best quality ingredients from anywhere in the world that provides them. Thank you also to Prime Fitness USA, um, the best equipment for someone looking to build muscle and make the most of their time. Um, I chose to reach out to Prime personally. They never reached out to me. I reached out to them because I knew what they had, and I really believed in their product, and I brought every one of their pieces into my gym, and we still use them every day because, you know, we're all about mindful attention to detail. We are muscle intelligence. We are the ones teaching the best people in the world, the smartest people in the world, how to build muscle in the least amount of time. Uh, Another shout out to Gasp and Better Bodies for always taking great care of myself and my trainers and my staff. If you guys want to get a discount for Gasp Better Bodies, head over to bampakolsky.com slash podcasts and check out the show notes from this show and all the other shows and you can find transcripts there as well. So have a wonderful day. Upgrade your life, stay focused, and live a life of greatness. Join us on BenPokolsky.com to learn the cutting-edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life.